Um, hello. So, yeah, hello. So let's start. Um, today we are very happy to have Xun Wang visiting us. Uh, Xun Wang is a third-year PhD student entering his fourth year at Connor University. Xun Wang has done a lot of fancy works in kind of a very interesting work in image generation, like uh, a style transfer. Uh, image to image translation, his work on, on adaptive instance normalization, I think is very popular uh, uh, right, right now. And also his work on image to image translation, the uh, Munich, Funnits, this kind of work, uh, I, I think super hard. So we are very glad to talk, uh, kind of to uh, listen to his talk. And uh, if you want to talk with uh, him, then just uh, drop by after the talk. Thanks. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, today I'm going to introduce some of my recent work on unsupervised image-to-image -image translation. But first, what is image-to-image -image translation? Here is an example. So the dog on the left is transformed to different kinds of animals uh, indicated by the images uh, on the top row. And the post of the input animal is preserved during the translation. This is a specific case of the more general image-to-image -image translation problem. In image-to-image -image translation, our goal is to map an, image, an input image from one domain to an analogous image in a different domain. And usually we want to preserve certain properties of the input image. For example, in this case, we want to preserve the pose of the dog. Uh, usually we need to like collect images from both domains, like uh, collect many dog images and cat images to try our model. And our model can be applied to uh, new inputs, uh, in, for example, in the dog domain. Translating a dog to a cat is mostly just for fun, but image-to-image -image translation has many other practical applications. Many computer vision problems, such as super resolution, Deep blurring, they can be viewed as a specific case of translating an image from one distribution to another distribution, like transfer, transferring from blurry distribution to a sharp distribution. Also, image to image translation can be used as a data augmentation tool to generate more training data. For example, if you want to try an autonomous driving system, but most of your training data is like summer images. You can use image-to-image -image translation to generate images in a different weather conditions, such as rainings, to make it more robust. So advances in image-to-image -image translations may lead to improvements in all the downstream tasks. Image-to-image -image translation can be studied in either a supervised setting or a non-supervised setting. In the supervised setting, we are given pairs of corresponding images from the two domains. Like we know uh, this pair of contour and RGB images are the same shoes. But in the unsupervised setting, we only have two data sets, and we don't know what images should be mapped to which. For example, we have like data set of uh, day images and a data set of night images, but they are not aligned. So unsupervised image-to-image -image translation is a much harder learning problem because there are much more ambiguities. However, it has broader applications because in many cases, it's very hard or impossible to collect paired training data in the two domains. So in this talk, I will focus on the unsupervised setting, where we have two data sets, but we don't have any pairs between them. Most image-to-image -image translation models are based on generative adversarial networks, or GANs. Uh, in GAN, we have two networks that are competing with each other. So the generator tries to generate realistic images from or some random latent vector from a prior distribution, such as a Gaussian. And we have another network called the discriminator that judges whether an image is uh, the real data or generated by the generator. So the, the generator learns to generate images that are hard for the discriminator to distinguish. And as the training proceeds, the two networks will improve each other 
And finally, in the ideal case, the distribution of the generated images will be the same as the distribution of real images. It can be extended to the unsupervised image-to-image -image translation setting. And the simplest method is to just use again, but instead of feeding it with a random noise vector, we're feeding it with an input image, for example, a dog image from the first domain. And so the discriminator judges whether an image comes from the target domain, for example, the cat domain, or whether it's generated by the generator network. So uh, the generator learns to generate images that look like a cat, but the translated images may not be related to the input image. In fact, it can be, it can, an, an arbitrary cat image will satisfy the discriminator. But we need the generator to, but we need the translation to preserve certain properties of the input. So uh, there are a lot of ambiguities, as I said, and we need more constraints to regularize the training. So uh, there are like uh, two early and uh, very successful unsupervised image-to-image -image translation models. Uh, they are cyclegan and unit. They propose different kinds of constraints to regularize the solution space. In cyclegan, they propose the cycle consistency, which means that if you translate a dog to a cat and translate it back, you should reconstruct the original dog. And the translation networks uh, for both directions are trained together, and they provide supervision signals for each other. On the other hand, there is the unit method, uh, which is the short name of unsupervised image-to-image -image translation. They propose a different assumption, which I call shared latent space. So they first assume that the latent space, uh, they first assume that uh, each, each domain has an autoencoder that autoencodes an image to a latent space. It further assumes that the latent space can be shared by both domains, such as the two analogous images are mapped to the same latent code. So to translate an image from one domain, let's say dog domain, to another domain, we simply encode it using the uh, encoder of the source domain and then decode it using the decoder of the target domain. And it's easy to see that if the autoencoder is perfect, the cycle consistency is automatically achieved. So uh, in other words, shared latent space is a stronger assumption than cycle consistency and it implies cycle consistency. Our work is largely built upon the shared latent space assumption proposed in the unit work. So here is an example translation results generated by state-of-the-art uh, image-to-image translation models. So you can translate the contour or a sketch of a shoe to a photorealistic RGB photo of the shoe. And the quality is actually pretty good. However, there is not just a single answer to this problem. As humans, we can easily imagine many different shoes that have the same contour. For example, uh, this red shoe or this white shoe. A question is then, can the existing image translation models do the same thing? Well, you can get a bit of the stochasticity by applying like dropout or some other random randomizing techniques to the uh, translation network. But the, the output is still largely the same and the diversity is very limited. So remember in the original game, we also have a Gaussian noise vector uh, as the input to the network and by sampling different uh, noise from the prior distribution, you get like different images. Can we do the same thing for image to image translation models? And people have tried that. So they like uh, similar to uh, the unconditional GAN, 
they feed a randomly noise vector uh, to some layers of the network, but it does, it's not successful, and the random vector is largely ignored by the network. So here uh, we say the output distribution of the translation model is unimodal because this distribution is concentrated around a single mode and it's almost deterministic and lacks diversity. So we, uh, we want to bridge this gap between human imagination and the state-of-the-art image translation models. So we want to generate a diverse set of outputs from a given input image. And this is clearly an important problem, and humans have no trouble doing that. However, uh, as I said, the problem cannot be easily solved by injecting randomness to the network, by making the network to be stochastic. The network just ignores whatever stochastic stochasticity that is injected. So why this is the case? We want to understand the reason that why the network always ignores the stochasticity. And we analyze this problem, and we prove that even if the networks are stochastic, that is the, the translation model between the two domains, they can be like arbitrarily flexible, they can model arbitrarily flexible conditional distributions. If we train the two models using the original cyclogan objectives towards the optimum, which implies match the marginals, your output, your, your distribution of the translation output should be the same as the images in the target domain. And cycle consistency, which means if you translate an image to the target domain and translate it back, you get the original image. Uh, if uh, assuming these two conditions. Uh, we can prove that the generator still collapsed to a deterministic functions. This is quite intuitive to understand. So let's say we have a sample x1 from the first domain. Suppose we can randomly sample two different outputs in the second domain. Since we assume cycle consistency, if we translate an image to another domain and translate it back, we should get the original input deterministically. So both inputs are deterministically back, mapped back to x1. However, due to cycle consistency in the other direction, x1 should be deterministically mapped back to x2 prime and also to x2 double prime, which means x2 prime and x2 double prime are actually the same, and the translation function collapses to a deterministic function. So remember that shared latent space is an even stronger assumption than cycle consistency. So since cycle consistency is fundamentally not compatible with uh, multimodality, shared latent space also does not allow multimodality. I have a question. In the formulations on the last page, you have two uh, cycle consistent terms, right? And uh, here. Yes. Yep. You have two cycle consistent terms. What if you just remove one, uh, one of them, like the one from from uh, uh, x two domain to x one domain, and then back to x two domain? Let's, let's just remove this one and only have the other one. Do you, do you still have the same problem? Uh, then you can gen then you can get one too many mapping. Yeah. So you you don't have this problem. and then maybe it will decrease the quality of the generated image. I, I, I don't know the, the issue. What after we do, after we do that? <coughs> so fundamentally, cycle consistency is a too strong assumption for multimodal translation. And uh, so, to achieve multimodality, we need to develop a different assumption, a different set of constraints. And let's take a step back and think more about the image-to-image -image translation problem. 
Usually, the two domains we are interested in come from the same underlying structures. They have this, uh, some shared commonalities. For example, whether it's a summer image or a, a winter image, uh, they all they, are, they all captures the same distribution of natural landscapes. Also, whether it's uh, uh, contours or RGB photos, uh, they are all just different renderings of some uh, physical shoes. So the, the physical shoes or the underlying natural scenes uh, are the underlying commonalities behind those images, and we refer to them as the content. We refer to the specific way of rendering the content to an image as the style of an image. So in other words, the content represents the domain invariant information that is shared by the both domains. And the style represents the domain-specific information, the specific information that makes the image belongs to that domain, that makes an image belongs to the winter domain or belong to the summer domain. So during translation, the content of an image should be preserved. For example, uh, we don't, when we translate a contour to a photo, we still want it to be the same shoe. And when we translate a winter image to a summer image, uh, we still want it to depict the same thing. So the content should be preserved during translation, but the style of an image should be modified. So where should the diversity comes from? The diversity, so, so each, domain, uh, they, each domain does not have just a single style latent code. They have a distribution of styles. So the diversity should come from the style distribution of the target domain. For example, uh, when we translate a contour to a shoe, the shoe could have different textures or colors. And they are like a, a style distribution in the target domain. And so the multimodal translation should capture those diversity uh, in the generator function. So instead of as in unit, which has a single shared latent, shared and domain invariant latent space, so we think that the problem is that they don't consider the style distribution of each individual domains. So as a result, they are not able to generate diverse and uh, multimodal results. Uh, in this work, we propose multimodal unsupervised image translation, image to image translation, or uh, MUNIT. So here we assume that the image representation space can, can be disentangled into a content space that is shared by both domains and is domain invariant. Also, each domain has its individual style space that are unshared and captures the domain-specific information. For example, in this case, the content captures the shared information between the two domains, which is probably the pose, the, ha the, ha the head pose of the animal. However, they have different style spaces. So the, the dog has different distributions of textures or like uh, uh, colors or like uh, some uh, small shape changes. And those uh, domain specific information is captured in the style space of each individual domain. So to translate an input image to another domain, we, so we simply extract its content code. Remember, we need to preserve the content. We need to preserve the, the pose of the dog. But we can sample different style codes from the target style distribution. And by sampling different style codes and recombining them with the, the input content, uh, we, we should be able to generate a diverse set of outputs that have different styles. But they all belong to the target, target domain of the styles. So we disentangle the latent space into two components, a content space and a style space. Here, uh, some notations, x denotes the images, and c is the content code, and s is the style code. So uh, during training, 
we enforce the autoencoder uh, to be like behave like an autoencoder. So we first uh, given an input, we encode it to uh, the style code and content code, and we reconstruct them using another decoder. And also, we during training we also like the model to do translation. So we, for example, extract the content code of this dog image, and we randomly sample a style code in the target style space. And uh, the target domain decoder generates an output image based on the input content code and a random style code. So, and the style codes, they, they are just come from a simple prior distribution, such as the Gaussian. It seems as now, by intuition, this style code should encoding it's a dog or it's a cat. But intuitively, if I also want to include the color, for example, the cat is black, the color into the uh, style instead of, uh, in the content, do we have any way to enforce this one and to have some controllability to uh, assign some kind of attributes, sem semantic meaningful attributes into the style or into the content? Okay, so you mean that uh, we not only want to preserve the pose of the dog, we also want to preserve the color of the dog. Um, yeah, so currently, yeah, you can see it this way. Uh, yeah, so first, this is not always possible. For example, if the two domains have completely different color distributions, then you cannot like uh, preserve the original color of the dog. And uh, so if the color distribution is indeed similar, uh, probably you can add some like uh, constraints to this model. For example, just the average color of the output image as the to to the input image. I think the essential problem here is just by this kind of uh, loss function. What the loss function does to um, determine which part is content, which part is a style. I think this. Uh, I I do not think we have. Uh, and explicit control of uh, the dis uh, the difference between these two. Yeah, yeah. I will introduce the loss functions here. So our model is trained with two kinds of loss functions. Uh, the first is bidirectional reconstruction loss, which enforces the autoencoder to be uh, bijective. And uh, we also have a GAN loss, uh, which enforces the, for example, the output image should look like a cat or should look like a dog using uh, the GAN framework. So, uh, we, so the bidirectional reconstruction loss, uh, as the name suggests, consists of reconstruction loss in two directions. The first direction is from an image, we encode it and then decode it, we should reconstruct the original image. This is just a normal training objective of image autoencoders. And we also have a latent reconstruction loss uh, for the content and style code. So we first encode the image to its latent code. And we decode the latent code to the output image. And we encode it back to the latent space, which will reconstruct the original latent code. So these two loss functions enforce the autoencoders to be uh, uh, bijective and uh, uh, basically reconstructs the images or the latent codes in both directions. And uh, as all the existing works, we also have a GAN loss. So uh, from the dog, we generate a output. And the output should uh, look like a cat. So the output distribution should be the same as the cat distribution in our data set. So here, this gray, gray dotted line does not enforce these two images to be the same. It just enforces that these two image distributions to be the same. Uh, so for S2, you're constraining it to a random distribution that is from a cat image, right? Because like, that, that, if that's anything, it could be from a dog image. You're, you've defined sort of different classes, and you're sampling from randomly from a certain class. Is that correct? Mm, so we can do like a sampling from different distribution, 
and map it to the like de decoder using the same network. We are just, or you can we just we can just use a different the same prior distribution and use different networks to map it to the output. Okay. So it's essentially similar. So here, Q kind of the prior Q one, Q S one, Q S two. I think it's just. <laughs> Standard Gaussian. Yeah, so here S1 and S2 are standard <laughs> Gaussian, but the domain specific characteristics are captured by the different decoders. Okay. It's a really good question earlier to me. It's not obvious <clears throat> how content versus style is determined. So I could imagine a scenario where uh, the variation, the style is in the pose and the content is the kind of the color. Like what, what, like how, do, how, does, how does it, what makes it decide that the variation is among color and not pose? Mm. <clears throat> so we, for, for example, we have, we have data set of cats and dogs. And uh, so they are like uh, just pictures of like different head faces like in different angles. So essentially, uh, if you just extract, for example, the face key points, their distribution is probably the same or very similar. But for uh, cats and dogs, they have very different color distributions or like texture distributions. It's because the texture and color are, there's more variation in that. Yeah. So here is our full training objective. Basically, uh, we optimize the model using a linear combination of all the previously introduced uh, loss functions. Uh, to further understand like, uh, the, the, the constraints implied by our model, so, so here is same set, so we just do like normal like autoencoder with scans, but why does our model successfully disentangle the content space from the style space. So here are several uh, results. So if we, so here we show that if we try our model on two optimality, the content code is domain invariant, which means the content code PC1 and PC2, they have the same distribution. So, uh, uh, so it captures the like, commonalities between the two domains. Also, uh, for drawing distribution matching, so suppose that we have, uh, so we have two generators, uh, which defines two conditional distributions. One is uh, PX2 conditional one, X1, and another is PX1 conditional two, X2. So these two conditional distributions together with the original data distribution, they define two drawing distributions. And our constraints, uh, if it's uh, properly optimized, and uh, it will force the two drawing distributions to match with each other. So it's kind of uh, a similar but weaker uh, constraints than cycle consistency. So still, the models in the both directions, uh, they are trying to provide uh, supervision signals to each other. So this, this, these two models should arrive at the same drawing distributions. Also, uh, as I introduced earlier, cycle consistency is a too strong constraint for uh, multimodal translation. But our model, uh, although our model cannot guarantee cycle consistency. Like if you translate a dog to a cat and translate it back, you may not arrive at the original dog. However, uh, our model permits a weaker form of cycle consistency, which we call style augmented cycle consistency. So uh, if we denote the image and uh, the style code in the another domain, if we uh, denote the concatenation of them too as uh, edge as another latent variable. And our model defines the uh, invertible and deterministic mapping between uh, these two augmented space, be these two augmented spaces. Although our mapping is, determ uh, is stochastic for the image spaces, uh, it's deterministic in these augmented spaces. 
And uh, if our model is trained until optimal, uh, we have uh, the translation function between the two augmented spaces. They are inverse of each other. So intuitively, it can be understood as following. Uh, basically, if we translate, uh, if we translate an image to a target domain and translate it back, but using the original style of the input image, not using a random style, we should obtain the original image. And uh, it's important to note that we, we this style consistency is implicitly implied by the bidirectional reconstruction loss, and we don't have to explicitly train our model using the cycle consistency. So I introduced the training of motivation and training objectives of our model. And next, I will introduce the detailed implementation of it, especially how we combine the content code and style code in the decoder to produce the output image. But before that, I want to take a detour on of my previous work about style transfer. So style transfer is kind of related to image to image translation, but it's mostly focused on the artistic domain. So given a content image, for example, a photo, and a style image, for example, a painting, we want to render the content image in the style of uh, the style image, in the artistic style. And uh, in a previous work, we find that the mean and variance of deep features uh, encode the style information of an image. And style transfer can be simply achieved by aligning the mean and variance of the content image features to the mean and variance of the style image features, like this. So more specifically, we have a input content image and the input style image. We encode it to some style, we encode it to some feature space, and we do this operation. So the mu and sigma and mean and standard deviation computed uh, among different spatial locations for the same example. So basically, uh, this, uh, this equation uh, first normalizes the mean and standard deviation of the content features, and then apply a uh, fine transformation based on the mean and standard deviation of the style features. So it essentially aligns the content features to the mean and standard deviation of the style features. And to do that, uh, we, we can translate uh, the, the, the style of the style image to the content of the content image. But here, we don't have a style image. We have a style code, which is a random vector. So instead of computing uh, mu and uh, mean and standard deviation among spatial locations, we simply use a multi-layer perceptron to generate the new mean and standard deviation uh, for the content image using uh, the, the style code. So, so here, uh, the difference is that uh, instead of computing the new mean and standard deviation from some style features, here the is generated using a neural network by the style code. Also, uh, we can like stack multiple, uh, this I call other in layers. Uh, basically, uh, after many, uh, after each convolutions, and the idea was later adopted in StyleGAN. And they use other in, in exactly the same way as all does, but for unconditional image generation. And they got really impressive results. So I have a question about this. Um, here, you kind of see that the style is encoded in the mean and variance of these features. But it depends on how we calculate the mean and variance, whether we calculate over kind of the spatial dimension, HWO, we calculate over the channel dimension, or yeah. even we calculate over the batch dimension. Can you kind of comment on different ways to calculate them and why calculate over the, I think, instance normalization calculate in the kind of spatial dimension, and why this is a good choice to encode style? Yeah, so by mean and variance, we always mean the 
So here we always mean the mean and variance computed among different spatial locations, not across batch dimensions or not across channel dimensions. So it's a way of getting uh, some global statistics of this image. So like each feature vector encodes some local properties of an image patch. And we, if we get the, if we compute the like first and the second momentum of those feature distributions, we get a statistics, distri statistics distribution of the, the features. So it's kind of like a, a global, a global uh, description of the styles. Let's say if, uh, for example, there's uh, one feature that detects a particular type of uh, oil strokes. Uh, for like oil paintings, uh, these feature activations will probably be very high. And if, we, if you like transfer these activations to some other images, uh, if you like get also like get a high activations, but for a different content image, uh, you probably should be able to translate that image to the style of an oil painting. Uh, I was just going to ask uh, if anyone's tried like using instead of convolutions in between the the ADA ends, um, using like recurrent neural networks there instead, like an LSTM layer. Mm. So for LSTM, uh, for example, if it's already used in language, uh, they don't have the spatial dimensions, so they don't. So instance normalization does, does not apply there. But uh, there are some papers that uh, propose adaptive layer normalization, uh, which works pretty well for like language style transfer. So here is the detailed network architecture of our model. The content code is a 2D feature maps, so it can better represent the content structure. And style code is a one-dimensional feature vector, so it captures the global style information. And uh, as introduced earlier, our model uses a multi-layer perceptron to generate other in parameters in, after each convolutional layer of these several residual blocks. And then the output features upsampling by several uh, up convolution layers to get the output image. Uh, here are some quantitatively results. So we employ, uh, so we compare our method with previous models such as UNIT and Cyhogan. We also tried a, a variant. Uh, we call cyclogan with noise, which we inject the a, a random Gaussian noise vector to the bottleneck of the cyclogan. So uh, we employ two metrics. One is quality, and quality is uh, obtained by user studies, and diversity, which is obtained uh, by basically uh, computing the perceptual distance between two random output images given the same input. And so we can see that uh, our model uh, achieves both higher quality and much higher diversity than the previous model. Also, we do some ablation studies to verify like whether all the loss functions are useful. If you remove one of the reconstruction, in fact, the diversity increased even more diverse than the final model. Yeah, so also we compare our model with bicycle again, which is a multimodal image translation model, but for supervised setting. So they require like parallel data between the two domains. So uh, we say that. Uh, our model can achieve a comparable but slightly lower quality, but we achieve a, like slightly higher diversity. But our model does not need any supervision, any parallel supervision between two domains. I know, how many are left? In addition, uh, in some data sets where uh, we know the, the ground truth modes or ground truth categories of each domain, we employ uh, inception score 
to measure the quality of the output images, uh, which we refer to as IS, or a conditional inception score, uh, which not only measures quality, but also measures uh, the diversity given, uh, given the same input. And uh, our model uh, achieves higher inception score and also higher conditional inception score than our previous models. Here I will just show some photos, some uh, sample results. Like uh, our model can translate a contour to uh, photorealistic shoes. And uh, we can like sample uh, shoes with different colors and styles, uh, but they are like different from the ground shoes. But they all remain faithful to the original input. Also, we do the same thing for the uh, handbags. And also, we can translate a shoe back to the contour domain. Uh, the diversity is kind of hard to notice, but uh, uh, still, we, we get like different levels of contours, and like different levels of contours, and also they all remain faithful to the original input. And our model is quite general and can be applied to uh, many cases. For example, uh, translating between uh, animal images, like translating house cats to dogs or uh, house cats to big cats. Also, uh, we do some like synthetic to real adaptation experiments. So Cynthia is a synthetic street view data set, and Cityscape is a real world street view data set. And in Cynthia, there are like images in very different weather and season conditions. So we can transfer a given Cityscape image to Cynthia images with diverse weather conditions, such as snowing, raining. Uh, but uh, the, in the other direction, since cityscape images are mostly sunny, we don't get much diversity in the uh, weather, but we still get like diversities in the, for example, lightings or like the texture of the roads. We also try to uh, translate between summer images to uh, snow images. And for example, we can uh, get snow winter images with different amount of snow, or like summer images with different amount of leaves. Yeah. Oh, uh, I think it's due to the camera of the data sets. This is counted as a style, I think, in that <laughs> Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of tricky. <laughs> Also, so in the previous random translation, we basically feed a random style code uh, from the prior Gaussian distribution, and we get random outputs. What if we feed a, uh, a style code of an example image in the target style domain? For example, we extract the content code of this contour and the style code of this shoe, and we recombine them. And the results... Uh, shows that we can effectively transfer the style of the style image to the content. In this case, mostly color and textures, and in this case, uh, we can translate a, a, this tiger to ca a cast of different appearances, but with the pose is preserved. After uh, we released the paper, people have applied, to, applied it to many different tasks. For example, in medical imaging, the data is usually very sensitive and hard to collect. So people have tried to use MUNIS to generate training data for medical imaging applications, such as laparoscopic images, MRI images, or CT images. Also, MUNIS has been used in the context of autonomous driving in order to synthesize training data in different uh, weather and season conditions. And perhaps a bit surprisingly, our method is also applicable to problems outside the image domain, such as voice separation or uh, music style transfer. So 
MuNet works great for multimodal translation, but a limitation of MuNet is that it only works with two domains. So we need to train a new model for a different pair of domains. Suppose there are n models, we need to train n times n minus one different models. And this will become prohibitively large if we have many domains. The multi-domain translation problem has been tackled by some previous work, such as Stargan. And their idea is also to have a shared latent space for all the domains. To translate an image to another domain, we first encode it to the latent space and feed the latent code to the decoder together with a one-hot encoding that indicates which target domain you want the decoder to translate it to. And the decoder can produce an output uh, corresponding to uh, the one-hot encoding. And Stargan have tried experiments on like facial expressions transfer. And for example, they can transfer an input image to uh, like angry or happy or fearful expressions. Uh, their data set has like 40 expressions, and they only need a single model because all the, the encoder and decoders are all shared by all the domains. However, there's still a problem. What if uh, we want to translate an image to an unseen domain? For example, I really want to know what my face would look like after eating a lemon, but I, I, of course I don't want to actually eat a, eat a lemon. <laughs> So, of course, uh, this expression, this domain is not seen during the training of Stargan, and uh, Stargan cannot help me with that. It cannot produce anything because it's not trained on this domain. And the, this problem is particularly interesting in the few shot setting where we have only a few examples in the target domain. Because if you, if you have many examples, you can just simply retrain a new model. What if you only have a few examples, like a few examples of eating a lemon in the target domain? Uh, can, can the models like translate to, to the new domains uh, without retraining it, and uh, just with a few examples? It's very challenging for existing models, but it's not a problem for humans. For example, a person, if a person see a standing dog for the first time in their life, they still, they will have no trouble imagining them, a tiger looking, or what it would look like when it's lying down, because it has a lifetime experience of seeing other animals in the lying down position. So people can easily make this kind of analogy, even if they see this kind of animal in the first time. So in uh, following work, we want to extend uh, MuNit to this few shot and unseen domain setting. What we do is we collect a large data set that contains many domains or many different classes of images. And in this case, we collect a data set that contains uh, the, the faces of many different kinds of animals. And during training, we, we let the model to practice the future of translation scenario. At each iteration, we randomly select the domain, and we train, we, we train our model to translate a content image to that domain using only very few examples, let's say just a single example. The idea is similar to meta-learning, where people train their model on a large set of tasks, <laughs> where people train their model on a large set of tasks so it can quickly adapt to new tasks. So here we train our model to translate between uh, many different pairs of domains using only a few examples so that we expect it to quickly adapt to new domains. So I'm just wondering how much this now actually is unsupervised because you seem to be moving more to the supervised domain. Because in a sense, when you have like the star again, you have different subdomains. This is just different subsets of your data. Uh, so like classes in some sense, and that you have to have some from somewhere. So like in which sense is this now 
still unsupervised? Or like, where does it fit in there? Could you just comment on that? Yeah, so it's unsupervised because we don't need pair data. Let's say we don't need a, the, a dog and a, pair, and a cat that are in the exactly same pose. So that's the unsupervised part. Uh, but for supervised part, as you say, we, we still need a class label of those images, like a domain label of those images. Yes, you need your data to come in clusters, basically. Yeah. And you need to know that these clusters, that they are clean in a sense, like they all capture the same thing that you, that you care about. So it's like a, a more granular kind of supervision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a different kind of supervision. By uh, unsupervised here, we mean like unpaired or unaligned data. Yeah, related to that, I was wondering, have you considered uh, using, uh, like, disentangling your latent space into more than two parts? Into more than Because now two. you have, like, the style and the... And mm. maybe you want to have, like, different styles so that you can capture more? Yeah, but uh, so if we explicitly like uh, use, for example, different prior distributions for like different styles, uh, uh, so we we cannot like generalize a model to like a new styles because we it's a, like a predefined set of styles. Now you also have that, right? You have just one. Uh, yeah, so here we, we implicitly, basically, we implicitly define different style distributions uh, by like feeding an image to a style encoder that encodes the, the characteristics of the domains the image belongs to. So it's more like uh, implicitly inferring like different style distributions than like explicitly uh, uh, setting like different, partitioning like different style code. I just run that quickly. I think you can control the way in which you kind of vary the style by doing something like PCA on the like style distribution and then just changing the different axes along which you slide it. And the reason you don't need more than two is because you just have one half that's specific to a different domain and you have one half that's shared among all the domains. So you wouldn't gain anything by splitting it up into more. Uh, so during training, uh, it's like this. So we try, we teach our model to translate between a lot of different domains. And during at test time, we, we have a few examples from a new domain. And we, we just uh, let the model do the same thing as it does during training, but on unseen classes or unseen domains. The, the network architecture is kind of similar to MUNIT, but uh, here, uh, instead of using a random, uh, style a random style code sampled from a prior distribution, we infer, we infer a style code from the few example images in the target domain. So here, uh, we basically uh, process each uh, images independently and we do an average pooling to get a class code or style code or domain code of this target domain. And we use it to guide the translation. Uh, similar to the MUNIT paper, we, we, we uh, generate the adding affine parameters uh, in the residual layers of the decoder. And here are some results. So the first and the second rows are uh, two examples uh, of the target domain. Actually, we have in this experiment we have five. Five in total, we have uh, five examples in the target domain, but we showed two here. And uh, X is the input content image, and this is the translation output. Note that the model has never seen uh, those domains or those kind of animals but it can effectively transfer uh, the content image to the unseen domains. 
that maybe I haven't really got it, but where exactly here is the few shot learning? Because it seems to be like it's, what you're doing is you're extracting the styles and the content and you're just doing style transfer basically. So it, it seems to me like it's just an inference task. There's no learning involved for the new unseen images, right? Uh, so for future learning, there are kinds of like, kinds of like two categories if you are familiar with the future classification in literature. So there is kind of like a matching networks or like pro prototypical networks, which does not learn during the few shot meta testing cases. So they, they simply extract a, a, a gen generic embeddings from the source domains and apply it to the, uh, the new, new domains. So that's basically what you're doing here, right? So which is basically yeah. what we are doing here. So there is no back property. Yeah, from yeah. So I think you are what you are referring is more like a model agnostic meta learning or like optimization based future learning approaches, which is also future learning but it's just a different approach. Okay. So now this is interesting. In the traditional style transfer, you have one reference image to define the style, and in the image to image translation, you have a last nice data set to define the style. Now you have kind of, you are in the middle. So how, so now I think the hype, the number of uh, images to define the style is a hyperparameter. So how this hyperparameter is, affects the performance of your results? Mm, yeah, I will talk about this uh, maybe now. Mm -hmm. So uh, here, we vary the number of training classes that, that, that the model sees during training. And so uh, the more training, the more classes the model sees during training, the better performance uh, it is at test time. So the first two metrics are the higher the better, and the last one is the lower the better. Also, uh, for uh, if you vary the number of shots or if you vary the number of examples during test time, also you, you get like higher performance if you have more examples. But doing training, if you use so higher number of shots, uh, that's a parameter, hyperparameter for training, so what's the performance? Uh, actually, we find that it's not important. It's not very important. So we train them all model under the one shot learning during training always, but at test time, we can do like few short testing. Okay. Uh, also here are some results of transferring births to a different categories. For example, the, the model can like quickly extract the uh, characteristics of this kind of bird and applying it to the input image without ever seeing this kind of birds during training. Also, uh, we test it on flowers. Um, so all these examples look really great um, and awesome. Uh, what, what types of input images or classes does it not do so well on? Like. Yeah, yeah, we all have some examples. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we also have some food translation to like generate uh, delicious food if you are hungry. Cast <laughs> more hungry. <laughs> are you just showing two because you use two or is it? Oh, we have five. But five. Okay. We show two here. So, if there is a large gap in terms of geometry, yeah, sometimes. Object. Yeah, even if the, the, the geometry gap is large, the translation is kind of okay. <laughs> also, this kind of translation. <laughs> I mean, it becomes kind of hard to judge what right. what it is capturing and if it's even good or bad. It's just it's, yeah. it's a picture, and it's <laughs> being, if I just squint at it, they all look almost like they're in the same domain. So yeah, I think if there is a large gap between x and y's, then it just kind of emits y, I think, uh, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Which makes sense because the shared content between them is like, minimal. But it makes sense, but like he was suggesting, what is the right thing, yeah. or how do you validate it? It looks like 
that. Interesting. Um, the style information is almost dominating the result. In fact, the content part, like the second column, um, would have been great if the fried rice, there were <laughs> seven, six <laughs> islands of those. Um, could you comment on that? Like the add I in uh, when it kind of um, reshapes the distribution using the style code? Yeah. So uh, the problem is that uh, the target domain probably uh, don't have that the, the kind of examples that uh, different rise, different pieces of rises are clustered like this, this, in this way. So, uh, so the target image should look at, look like a, an example image in the target distribution. And uh, so, I think it really depends if the two domains are very different, then uh, the shared properties, the, the domain invariant properties, the commonalities is like uh, quite subtle. So uh, there is like only very little information that, it, that can be shared by the both domains. So like that's why like only very few information is preserved. Yeah, so like maybe the fact that, that um, dumplings come in six different little shapes um, is specific to that style versus for fried rice it comes in one shape. So it wouldn't even be able to output something. Uh, the yeah, content right, is dumplings not. Dumplings on top of the fried rice, if yeah. you see closely. But. I think the main reason here is still this kind of measure lack a uh, mechanism to control this style, uh, to inject our semantic uh, understanding of some style. It just lets the model to, con to determine what is style, what is content by itself. Right. Do you have like a collage where you have the same X but with different Ys? Do you kind of see how much variety they actually capture? Or does it generate more or less always the same image no matter what the X is? Uh, the, um, the variety of like, the, uh, the new stylized one. Yeah, we tried this before, but uh, we don't show it in the slides. So, so actually, for example, if you uh, use the same X but different Y, the the shape will be kind of similar to this this shape, but with the of course it's like uh, still uh, looks like the the target domains defined by Y. You know, in style again, paper from NVIDIA, um, they showed early, when you infuse the random information in the early layer, then it tends to kind of uh, modify the global structure of the image, whereas if you go towards the end, then it kind of just focused on local texture information. So I'm, I'm still looking at the second column there, and if um, in, in your previous slides, the first three or two layers were fused with style information, and then the later part, just convolution layers. Did you think about kind of flipping that order in a way that we only infuse the style information towards the end? Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, I think yeah we can try like or you, we can try like similar to the video paper enforcing like infusing style information in all layers, but like using uh, style information for some layers we use style information from this image. For for the other layers we use style information from a different image. That could be very interesting to, to try as well. So uh, here we compare our model with uh, previous baselines. Here the results are under 20 short setting, where the target domain has 20 examples. And uh, so our model significantly outperforms all the baselines in, on the other metrics. And also the baseline models are trained on the, 20, uh, the, 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 uh, the examples in the target domain, but our model is never, has never seen the target domain during training. And uh, here are some limitations where our model does not perform very well. So the model does not work very well if the test domain is drastically very different from the training domains. So it still relies on like the, the information it learns during translating between uh, many different domains during training. 
So for example, if it's like translating between different animal domains, uh, it can be it, it can be generalized to different animals, but it's hard to different generalize to other domains that are drastically different, like flowers, or so. So here, for example, if we train this model on the animal domain and give a like flower images, it won't like really transfer this animal to the flowers. And uh, we released the uh, online demo of, of Funit, a uh, few short unsupervised image to image translation. And it's called uh, Pet Swap. And people can use it to translate their pets to different categories. You are welcome to try as well. Here are some instructions. Okay, we call this demo pet swap because this model is trained on animals, mostly pets, and we expect people to use it to like transfer their pets to different categories. But uh, it's not in our control, and people start to mess around it with it, and they try to translate their faces to animal faces. And our model actually works surprisingly well, although it never sees any human faces during training. So, so the content image. So here, I previously said it cannot generalize to like drastically different style images, but actually it can generalize to very different content images. Also, uh, it's, introduced, it's interesting to see some analogies it make, like transferring the long hair to the long ear of the dogs. And perhaps even more surprisingly, it also works on cartoon faces. <laughs> Uh, we release uh, the code of both MUNIT and uh, FUNIT, and feel free to try if you think they might be useful for your work or you just want to have some fun. <laughs> I have a question about the performance. Sure. So, uh, FUNIT is designed for few short learning to for unseen domains, but if did you perf uh, did you compare its performance just unseen domains with stack and this kind of uh, learning uh, in domain? Uh, style transfer. So here the star gun is trained with uh, only 20 examples. You mean uh, what would be the performance look like if we train the star gun using all the examples? Yeah, uh, I mean just do we compare this uh, kind of the uh, translation performance on the uh, domain we already see, see doing the training. I see. So star gun can be trained and it can be uh, measured. Yeah, actually, uh, we have some results in the supplementary of the paper. Uh, so compared with Stargan, even if we train the Stargan using all the images, and we test it on like the thin domains of Stargan. And for FUNIT, uh, uh, this domain is unseen for FUNIT, and we just use 20 images uh, to test FUNIT on this domain. And the results are actually comparable. Yeah, so I'm interested in whether the FUNIT also increase the in-domain style transfer performance compared with Stargun or other in-domain uh, style transfer or image translation <laughs> methods. Uh, yes, yes, I think this is the case. Uh, but uh, I think in that case, the performance mostly comes from like detailed uh, network architectural design, but not from like the the training algorithms, because the training is more designed for the, the, the unseen domains. And uh, finally, I want to thank all the collaborators uh, from Cornell, NVIDIA, and Alto University. Especially, I want to thank Ming Yuliu uh, from NVIDIA, and most of the work was done when I was interning with him. Thank you. Any questions?
So I'm still caught up on how you decide what ends up in the style and the content embeddings. And it seems to me like the main way to sort of control it is to change the relative sizes of the two embeddings. So could you comment on, like, during the training process, what you observed when you changed those relative sizes? Mm. You mean the, like, dimensions of the style dimensions code and yeah. content code? Right, because that's how much, how it gets to put as much information as it can into those two parts of the embedding. You know, if you, if you give it no style at all, everything has to go through the content part of the embedding. Mm. So during translation, uh, all the information in the original style is not used. So only the content code of the of the image is used. Uh, so that's also kind of a difference other than the uh, the size of the two embeddings. So one embedding is used during translation and another is not used and just randomly sampled. But because you have the constraint that the two embedding spaces have to be the same in that you can go from one image class to back out to another, whereas the style classes only correspond to one image class. It's going to try to put as much you know, information about that particular image instance in the style class as it can. And any leftover information about that particular image instance, i.e. the content, is going to have to go into the content embedding. And so if you adjust the relative sizes, you're kind of telling <coughs> how much you can put into style versus into content. Do you see what I'm saying? There, there are fewer constraints on the style embedding, and therefore it will use that more heavily versus the content embedding needs to be shared among multiple image domains. It, it's just, it seems like it's sort of arbitrary how content versus style get differentiated, and it's just a matter of how it can kind of optimally embed those. Yeah, so uh, in our network architecture design, there is also a, a like inductive bias we use. So um, the style parameters only affect the mean and standard deviation of the network activations. So it's applied in a global manner. Uh, so I think even if you like, uh, I try to make the style code very high dimensional and it doesn't change much because it still only affects the, the global information. So I was just <clears throat> wondering um, what your thoughts are on the problem where you can't have like these two subsets or these several subsets of data. Let's take your two, your daylight images and your nighttime images and you just put them all together and now we just forget that it is about day and nighttime. That is very interesting. So do you think, of, do you, are you aware of any work or do you have your thoughts on like the problem where you don't have that additional information in your data set, where everything is just one big set? Mm. Uh, that seems to be a, a very important prerequisite for this yeah. um, research direction. Yeah. So in the FUNIT work, in the few short work, so we use the class information only for the discriminator. So the discriminator needs to judge whether it belongs to a certain class or not based on, like, for real data, we have labels, and for generated data, we have the labels of the style images. Um, so if we don't have access to that labels, uh, we need some other ways to enforce the style information is preserved. So uh, uh, maybe we can uh, draw inspiration from like style transfer literatures, like they don't have uh, like class labels of images. But, but they, they also have two different subsets. They have a set of paintings and they have a set of images. So they come with a priori information about how the data set is. Construct, there's, there's structure in the data set that is exploited in a very clever way. I'm, I'm addressing the situation where you get a whole bunch of data, but you don't know what the structure is. You don't know that there are paintings and there are normal images, for example. But it's a truly unsupervised. Uh, I think in that case, uh, you have a different task, because in that case, you cannot define image to image translation. Image to image translation is essentially you must have two domains to transfer. So in that case, it's unconditional generation and the <coughs> control NVIDIA's work is in that domain, I think. Of course, it wouldn't be called image to image translation, but it would be about finding uh, representations of factors in your data that like somehow are interesting. Yeah, I think the NVIDIA work, the style gun is a good 
Maybe I'll give you an example. Well, this diagram also it. comes with like different domains, and it has data from different domains, and it trains it like that. So that's the opposite. That's then introducing more structured information into the data that is trained on. I was considering. Stargun is a big set of just face images. Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe I'll have to uh, look at the paper again then. Yeah. Yeah, I think he refers to Stargun. Oh, sorry, that's the Stargun. Oh, I thought you just mentioned Stargun. My bad. So yeah, they they basically they have a like just uh, unconditional, unlabeled data set of faces. But but here it was just I thought this paper was mostly just about producing nice images. There's no, uh, there, there's no style content separation. Yeah, in fact, there are some interesting uh, studies there. So like, it will answer your question, I think. Um, so a hypothetical, in the case where you're translating between the simulated driving data and the real driving data, let's say half the simulated driving data is in snowy scenes and half of it's in normal conditions. And for the real driving data, a quarter of it is in snowy scenes and three quarters of it is in normal. Would the network in this case recognize that snow is a part of the style or snow is a part of the content? Because now the distribution over snow versus not snow is very different between the two domains. Mm, it's very different or similar. So, so for both domains, they have like half snowy images. And no, half. one is half and half. One is a quarter and three quarters. Okay, okay. Then snow will be category. You you can put it into extreme. One is kind of half half. One is just ninety nine per, uh, percent versus one percent. Then in that data set, snow will definitely categories as a style, not a content. Yeah. So, uh, so in order for things to even have a chance of ending up in content, the distributions have to be quite similar, you know, to some extent, quite similar between the two domains. Yes. Like if you yes. if you didn't have you know heads looking in all different directions, then it might not have chosen pose yeah. as a thing to put in content. Yeah. Okay. In fact, I have a question about the training of the uh, fun it. So. You said that you only use the class information and the discriminator. I, I suppose it's like the AC gun type uh, discriminator. Um, do you think that it's equivalent to add a classifier for the uh, style uh, or for the style code? Just uh, I add a kind of cost entropy, add a classification head, and add that nose into your training. I think it's kind of uh, equivalent, but the only difference is that you share your weights with the uh, kind of the discriminator. Is that true? I had a classifier only for the style code, but not for the output images. Um, so can you go to the model application? Sure. <coughs> yeah, so what I mean is you add a, a kind of a classification head uh, for this red bounding box. Here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but even if the style code really extracts the style information, it may not be applied to the output image. Um, yeah, you like your uh, classification target is your input uh, class. So in this case, you directly inject the uh, kind of the style information, which is the class information, into this uh, latent code. You mean in addition to have a discriminator? Yeah. yeah. I think AC guy yeah. is kind of doing the similar thing, but it's just sheer kind of. Yeah, like that's an interesting idea, but we haven't tried it. Okay. I think in this case, it may solve the distribution un kind of uh, unbalanced issue because in this case, you directly inject the style information into the latent code. Yeah. Okay, so any other questions? Then, okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you for attending.